Shit. Shit. Give me a second here. Sometimes he video kicks in like that. Okay, wise. Well, oh, your speaker's not working properly. Let's do this. All right, guys. So hang on a second here. Test speaker. Test, test, one, two. Test, test. You know, Scott. Oh, you got me now? Okay, there we go. Now we're up and running. Okay. All right. <laughs> Gotta love a little technical glitch right off the bat. Better on the front end than in the middle, right? <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, hey, appreciate you guys. Yeah, you're on. Gotcha. Let me go through and get some of these questions here, Brad. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Tonight's topic is really going to be important to you guys. Want to definitely, definitely grab a pen and paper. Want to take some notes tonight. Uh, if you guys are joining us for the first time, hey, welcome to We Close Notes uh, and Note Night in America. We have these webinars every Monday night for the most part. Tonight's topic is owner financing your REOs. Uh, a lot of people ask, well, who's on these webinars? Who's on the Monday notes, basically? Well, we have, obviously, real estate investors. We have note investors uh, who are active in this business. We have petite, uh, people looking to get into notes of some sort. Uh, as always, these calls are recorded. We make sure I hit the record button, which I believe I did. Yeah, sure, we're good to go. Um, and you can catch those replays at vimeo.com slash we close notes. There is literally over 900 vid videos on the Vimeo of webinars and different stuff out there available for you as well. Uh, uh, if this is your first time, please make sure to connect with me at one Scott Carson on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And you can always find us on uh, YouTube and Vimeo by looking for at We Close Notes as well out there for you guys. So, uh, but you guys aren't here for me tonight. You're here for our very special guest who's an expert at what he does. And you guys should know we only bring in the best of the best to help you with your note business. So I'm honored to have uh, an amazing individual. Comes highly regarded from some of our mastermind members. I look forward to doing business with him. But whenever I get a phone call, from one of my mastermind members who's closing hundreds of deals, like, hey, you need to have this guy on. You need to bring this guy on and share uh, what he does because it's so powerful. So I'm excited tonight that our special guest is a graduate to the University of Montana Law School. He is a uh, general counsel with Bajorns of Law. He's a featured uh, corporate security and real estate attorney. I guess I forgot to hit the spell check there, but uh, good stuff is our buddy Jason Powell. Good evening, Jason. Hey, we're glad to have you. Hey, Scott. Thanks for having me. Appreciate being here. Yeah, no problem. And you've got a uh, little presentation put together and kind of how you're reaching out and or actually how you're really helping a lot of real estate investors and entrepreneurs out there with their uh, their REOs, the properties that they take back and, and turn them into cash flow assets. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm working with, uh, you know, probably eight or 10 people around the country who are, who are buying REO, who are buying notes um, and are dealing in REOs and, and turning those into uh, owner finance properties. Cool, cool. So if you want to go ahead, I'm going to turn it over and let you share your screen and let you pull up your presentation. We'll dive into it. And then as people ask questions, I'll uh, uh, interject as, uh, as it's relevant. If, if, if it can wait till the end, we'll wait till the end. But if it's irrelevant with what you're right on, I think it's important. I'll, I'll stop and ask you the question if that's okay. Like we keep, that way it keeps you flowing and rock and rolling, huh? Yeah, that works fine with me, Scott. Cool. Yeah. Is that, that good? It looks good. Just got to go to presentation mode and you're rock and roll, buddy. Let me get there. Presentation. There you go. Yeah. Okay. 
They're awesome. Good stuff, buddy. <laughs> You're more technically savvy than most of the attorneys I work with. <laughs> not, that's not saying much. <laughs> well, as Scott said, my name is Jason Powell. Uh, I'm an attorney with uh, the Bjornson Law Office. We're based out of Missoula, Montana. Um, however, I live and work out of uh, the state of Washington. Um, but regardless of, of where I live, I work with clients, uh, real estate investors and, and other clients who are located all over all over the country, really, including uh, including Canada as well. Um, you know, on this on this first slide here, I've got my email and my phone number as well as my my web address. Feel free to uh, jot that down. Um, you know, if you've got questions in the future, um, feel free to email me or give me a call. Um, you know, being an attorney, I can't start a presentation without giving uh, a little bit of a disclaimer uh, to let you know that this is for informational purposes only, and this does not constitute uh, legal or professional advice. Uh, I want to give you a little bit more of a background on me to just to help you understand uh, where I come from, what I what I assist uh, clients with, um, and kind of why I've I've been involved with uh, clients in this space. Um, as Scott said, I'm a corporate securities and real estate attorney. Um, I represent real estate investors and private money lenders in transactions all over the United States. Um, I've closed, helped close private money loans in about 40 states, 40, 42 states uh, all across the country. Um, I assist clients uh, as well um, in, the, in the legal compliance when they're looking to raise capital, uh, whether that be a startup company, a, uh, a real estate syndication for an apartment complex or, or blind pools. Um, most of that uh, I do focus on re for real estate funds as well as people who are syndicating uh, real estate deals. <clears throat> I am an active real estate investor. Uh, my wife and I actively uh, we buy and hold uh, properties here. Um, where we live. Um, I'm also uh, a principal of a newly formed real estate investment company that's focused on self-storage and multifamily opportunities across the United States. We're actually just uh, hopping into our, our capital raising mode here within the next month. Um, and, and lastly, I'm also a principal of Flip Street Capital, which is a newly, another newly formed real estate investment company that focuses on first position real estate loans, joint venture loans, as well, as well as buying REO properties. So in addition to advising people on this, I'm also uh, you know, there in the, in the pit with the people as well. Okay, let's turn now to a couple of, uh, what, I, what I see as the four main issues uh, with respect to seller financing. Um, you know, I apologize if, if some of this is, is, is old hat to some of you, um, but those four issues, number one, and the, and the biggest one is, the do, is, is Doc Frank. Um, you know, Dodd Frank came into effect um, after the after the financial collapse, um, and has has been kind of a boon, I guess we would call it for uh, us attorneys, um, in that there there are a lot of things that are restricted under there, and, and attorneys have 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 really done quite well underneath the Dodd Frank uh, Wall Street Reform Act. Uh, the other one is Truth in Lending, uh, Reg Z, uh, and RESPA. I like to lump Truth in Lending and RESPA together in terms of the disclosures that they require. Um, when you're doing owner financing or when you're, when you're, when you're um, uh, buying an, an owner-occupied properties. And that one other thing that I think gets left out a lot of times when you're talking about seller financing is each state has their own lending laws. Um, and we're going to touch on this a little bit later, um, but, but the vast majority of the states around the country, believe it or not, um, they're going to um, require uh, people who are doing owner financing more than more than a certain amount of deals to have a license in that state in order to comply with those licensing laws, uh, lender lender licensing laws in those states. So let's take a quick look at Dodd Frank. <clears throat> Dodd Frank only applies to consumer residential mortgage loans, um, and it's applying to to loans uh, made to consumers who are occupying those residential properties. Dodd Frank is not going to apply to the the sale of lots, even if they're res even if they're single family residential lots. It's not going to apply to commercial properties. It's not going to apply to investment properties, and it's not going to apply to residential properties in which the purchaser is not intending to occupy the property as as their primary residence. Now. For purposes of, of, of this webinar, the, the, the main takeaway for Dodd-Frank um, is Dodd-Frank is going to require you 
uh, to involve a loan originator in your owner financing transaction unless you're going to fall into one of the, one of the exceptions which we'll cover um, in the next couple of slides. So th this requires, so it, it applies regardless of whether or not you're using a land contract or a contract for deed, or in the alternative, if you're using a note and a mortgage or, or a deed of trust to own or finance that property to the owner occupant. Um, and again, I, again, as I mentioned earlier, so the, the, the big takeaway from Dodd-Frank is the use, either whether it's, whether it's your company being the licensed loan originator, or you're involving a middleman in there to be the licensed loan originator to take the application uh, to help with some of the disclosures um, and, and get all the information you need from that buyer in order to properly uh, do the transaction under Dodd-Frank. Now, as I mentioned, there are a couple of exceptions to Dodd-Frank. Um, one exception is, is the one property exemption. Uh, this is really intended for um, you know, people like myself or Scott who are, who are seller financing our own home um, to another buyer who maybe cannot get financing at the time. Um, it, it does expand it in, in the sense that it can be, you know, it can be a natural person, it can be an estate or it can be a trust. Um, again, with the intent being that it, that it be someone like myself who's moving out of my, my place and buyer uh, cannot get financing through traditional means. And so in order to, in order to meet um, the requirements of this one property exemption and, and not have to have uh, the loan originator. Again, you've got to be a natural person, a state or trust. You've got to provide financing for one property in a 12 month period. Um, you actually own the property that is securing the financing. So you can't use this transaction, uh, use this type of transaction to sell a property that you, that you don't own. You did not construct or act as the, con as the contractor on the construction of the property. Um, the financing that has to, has to result in a repayment schedule that does not involve um, a negative amortization. Balloon payments are allowed. Um, and then the financing must have an, a fixed rate or an adjustable rate that resets after five or more years. Now, the next exception that, that is likely going to apply to uh, you know, most people um, kind of jumping into this space uh, early on is the, is the three property exemption. Now, this is going to apply again to a natural person, a state, trust, or an entity. So it's going to apply to a partnership. It's going to apply to a limited partnership, a corporation, or an LLC, in addition to the natural person, a state, or trust. Now, this allows you to provide seller financing for, for up to three properties in a 12-month period, uh, as long as you own the property securing the financing, and as long as um, you want the contractor uh, for the property. Again, it must be fully fine, fully amortized uh, loan. There must be no balloon payments or structures allowed. And again, the financing must have a fixed rate or an adjustable rate that resets after five or more years. Now, one of the things that, that probably um, most people aren't aware of is that kind of the draconian penalties that, that exist under Dodd-Frank. Um, now, you don't see this applied very often, um, but they can be, they can be somewhat harsh in their application, including rescission and reformation of the contract. Um, it can refund all the monies paid, um, a return of the real property, it includes restitution, um, it includes uh, essentially paying back or compensating um, the, the buyer for any unjust, enrich, unjust enrichment, uh, payment of damages or other monetary relief, um, public notification regarding the violation, uh, limits that are placed on the activities and functions of, of the violating party. Um, I apologize for the, the typo in this last one, um, but there are civil penalties based on, based on the severity and the, and the number of, of, of violations you've had that range from $5,000 a day up to a million dollars a day. Um, you know, and as I'm sure most of you are aware as well that, you know, uh, you know the current administration as well as the Republicans have, ha have a desire to potentially scale back and or completely get rid of Dodd-Frank. Um, that would greatly change uh, this arena uh, under federal law, at least if that were to happen. Um, you're not going to have, you're, you're likely not going to have the need for uh, those loan originators, and obviously you're not going to have uh, penalties such as this um, involved. Now, this next slide, this is, um, 
I'm showing here a couple of options that I've got. Um, I've got clients who are around the country who are kind of using a couple options um, in, in the hope of, of getting around the, the exact wording of, of the, of the Dodd-Frank Act. Um, my opinion is they, at the end of the day, they may, they, they may still be violating the, uh, the spirit of the law. Um, but I have clients who are using series LLCs. Um, and if you're not familiar with series LLCs, there's about 11 state, 11, a handful of states around the country um, that basically allow you to form a, for lack of a better term, a, a mother LLC, which is the only LLC you have to register with that state. Um, and then you're able to form additional series LLCs underneath that mother LLC. Um, and you don't actually have to form those uh, with the state. Um, so you avoid the cost of those additional registrations and you also don't have to have an additional uh, registered agent fee for those uh, series LLCs. Um, so the only thing you're doing for the kind of the children LLCs is you're doing an operating agreement, um, you're getting an EIN number and then you can open a separate bank account. Um, the series LLC is, is very similar in nature to having multiple LLCs um, kind of without all the additional formation and registered agent costs. Um, I also have clients around the country who are using grantor land trusts, um, and they, they use these grantor land trusts primarily because they work with uh, multiple investors on multiple properties. So um, this is a way of, of designating uh, the beneficiary as being that client uh, who's responsible, who, who's invested in that specific property. Um, this is an this is an interesting um, this is an interesting way of doing it. Um, you know, I think one of the concerns I hear from from investors around the country is is the potential use of, of, of numerous bank accounts uh, for grantor land trust. But typically, uh, in a grantor land trust, uh, that, that grantor land trust is not going to have a separate bank account um, because you've got a, you've got a beneficiary who's a hundred percent the hundred percent beneficial ownership uh, owner 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 of that beneficial interest in that land trust. Um, and, and grantor land trusts are flow through land trusts. Um, so typically all that, that money is just going to flow through um, to the beneficiary. Um, and then I also have clients who are using, who are using um, rather than doing a series LLC, they're actually using um, a new LLC per three properties to get under that three property exception. Um, like I said, at the end of the day, um, while technically the, these kind of fit uh, within the within this with the framework um, and exact wording of the law, um, but the spirit of the law is kind of a different story, in my opinion. Um, but there's not a despite there being you know something like thirteen thousand pages of regulations on on Dodd Frank, there's very little case law um, kind of interpreting uh, some of these provisions. So my recommendations to my clients. Um, are you either become a loan originator or you work with a loan originator? Just take the take the chance out of it. Um, you know, in, in most cases, the, the buyer is paying the loan originator fee anyway. Um, you know, the loan originator, at least the one that I work with, with most of my clients, works fast and efficiently um, and is not super expensive. Um, so that's the advice that I like to give to my clients. Scott, do you have any questions you want to interject at this point? You're good. We, we have one question from somebody, but I think it'll, it'll wait till a little bit later on there for you. So you're, it's good. Uh, would your opinion be if it smells like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is a duck? When it comes yeah. to the different entities and kind of uh, go arounds, I guess, that you're talking about here? Yeah, that's my opinion. I mean, the, the, the one, especially when it comes to the series LLC or, or the, using the new LLCs, and the reason I say that is because at the end of the day, most of those are subsidiary LLCs of the main company. And so you, I don't think that that that's, that would work at the end of the day. The use of grantor land trusts in the case of where you have a different investor per property, I, I think is an option that, that more people should consider. Um, because at the end of the day, then you've got, you ultimately only have one person involved and that person is, is the beneficiary. Now it may get, a, it may become a little bit different if you've got an investor who's, who's doing a hundred of these with you. Uh, then you might run into the same kind of issues that, that that I think you run into with series LLCs or LLCs in general. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Um, and so there was actually a new TILA RESPA rule um, that I believe came into effect in 2015. 
Um, what this did is this kind of combined um, the disclosure requirements in the forms um, for, for compliance with that. Um, and so essentially what it did is it combined four disclosures into two forms, one being the loan estimate, uh, the other one being the closing disclosure. Um, so it does not apply to you know, home equity lines of credit, reverse mortgages, uh, mobile homes, um, or dwellings that aren't attached to the real property. Um, and it also does not apply, and it also does not apply to persons uh, who are making five or fewer mortgages per year because they are not considered creditors under this new rule. Um, now, if you're working with a loan originator, your loan originator should be, in my opinion, should be preparing this loan estimate and this closing disclosure um, that will go to the buyer. Um, you know, so if, if you're licensed as a, loan, as a loan originator, then you want to be preparing it. But if you're using a third-party loan originator, you want to make sure you use someone who will be preparing these, these documents for you. I've come across a couple of the loan originators who are not preparing these forms. Um, and as a result, I advise my clients to switch that loan originator over to someone who would prepare these forms. Uh, I think proper documentation and credit and, and uh, disclosures makes that, that paper that much more valuable too, versus it not being there. I, uh, when we, when I was a hard money lender, we used to disclose things like it, we, you know, the truth and lending statement, all that other stuff, good faith estimate anyway, just because it's a good habit to do. And I often find that very startling. Like you said, if somebody's not preparing these things, do they not have the software? Are they not fully versed in doing business on a traditional basis or regular basis the right way, right? Right, correct. And you're right. I mean, someone who's, someone who's doing this a lot and knows what they're doing should have access to the loan software that can kick these out in, in literally minutes. Yeah. Um, once, they, once they have all the information to, to input into there. Right. right. Um, you know, so this just goes through, um, you know, this probably don't need to drill down too much into this, but this TILA rest for rule. So the loan estimate is a form called H24. Um, this this slide here just shows you um, what requirements um, you're required to disclose in that form. Um, again, it's just looking at an estimate for like the cost and the transaction terms. Um, uh, who the who you know maybe and it may be provided by either the creditor or the mortgage or the or the broker you have involved. Um, so I know there are some loan originators out there who prepare all this and then they send it to send it to either me as the attorney or they send it to the creditor and then the creditor. Uh, and send that out to um, but again, just, just a form you want to make sure your, your loan originator is supplying for you. Uh, the closing disclosures form H25. Um, and the reason I'm kind of pointing out these, these forms um, is so that you can go back to your loan originator and ask them. You, know, you can even go back and look at some of, your, some of your old packages and make sure that those forms are a part of this. Um, and then if, if they're not, I, I would definitely advise you to have that conversation uh, with your loan originator. Um, and if your loan originator is not willing to do it, then I would, I would get in touch with either Scott or myself and we'll get in touch, you in touch with a, with a loan originator who will do this one. Um, Cause you, you do wanna you make, you do wanna make sure that you comply with this. All right, and, and this, this next slide, I've, I've been put at a link here. Um, so the Consumer Protection uh, Financial Bureau, um, there's, this, there's this link down here below that has, um, you know, compliance guide, guide to disclosure timelines, samples, videos, and just, a diff, just additional information um, if you want to go and, and find anything on, this, on these new TILA uh, rest for requirements. Okay, this last, one's a, this last one, in my opinion, is a big one because um, when, when I've been introduced to my clients and I, find, and I have new clients who are, who are kind of in this space, um, I can't say that I've come across one um, who actually was aware of this potential uh, down. Um, and potential issue. Um, now, and I must say that, that most people, including a lot of the big boys out there uh, that are playing in this space, have ignored this. Um, although I'm, I am aware of one, um, one of the big players in the market on the East Coast um, that actually has just, uh, just kind of wrapped up getting licensed in like 36 states in order to make sure that they comply with these requirements. So, the requirement is, so, so according to my research, and I've talked to a, an individual, uh, actually an attorney, um, who specializes in um, obtaining licenses for, for banks, brokers, loan originators, and different things like that, is that seller financing is considered mortgage lending in most states, and thus a mortgage lending 
mortgage banker, mortgage broker license is required in order to fully comply with those state lending laws. Now, one thing to keep in mind, and a lot of, a lot of my clients tend to be confused initially, is that, that these lending laws are completely different than Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank is a federal law, and these state lending laws are just specific to each individual state, and they are going to vary. Um, so, so one of the things that, you know, your failure to comply, um, you know, one, one or two of these failure to complies in a state is likely to result on a, on a slap in the wrist, um, and, and a kind of a, a, a letter saying, you know, don't do that again, um, and, and request to, to go and get licensing. Um, but if you're investing a lot of time and money and you're doing a fair amount of deals within one specific state, um, you really should consider um, looking into this and potentially going going and getting licensed. Um, like I said, you can get uh, you can get penalties, you can get fines, um, and one and, and I've got securities fraud claims in here, um, and and that's in there primarily because there are there are some people in this space who are working through funds, line pool funds, in which they've raised capital into those funds from you know 10, 20, 100 investors, and and failure to disclose um, something like this to investors in a private placement fraud down the road should the state um, come after that fund um, and start sending letters to to investors um, about about the lack of licensing. And so here's one specific example. I just took Michigan. I know that at least from for my clients that the Midwest and the Southeast tend to be tend to be tend to be bigger markets. So I just picked a kind of a state in the Midwest. Um, you know, I know Detroit's been a been a pretty pretty big market for this. Um, you know, since uh, since the um, since the crash. So if you look at the the statutes in in Michigan, they define a mortgage lender as any person that directly or indirectly makes or offers to make mortgage loans. And they define mortgage loan as a loan secured by a first mortgage on real property located in the state and uses a dwelling design for occupancy by, by four or fewer families or a land contract covering real property located in the state, again, used by, by four or fewer families. So the, the way this, the way Michigan has drafted its laws, this mortgage lender requirement is going to apply regardless of whether or not you're using a contract for deed or if you're using a note and a mortgage in Michigan. And, and I, 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 didn't, I, I didn't find in Michigan where they had a, like, a, like a two or three property exception. Um, I suspect they probably have a one property exception based on the fact that they're gonna, you know, they're gonna let you, know, you as the individual owner, seller finance your house without requiring you to be a, to be a mortgage lender. Um, but if you're doing more than that in the state of Michigan, you are essentially violating laws in Michigan by not, by not becoming licensed. Uh, so this last slide here is just um, to kind of to kind of summarize um, my suggestions uh, in this space to people who, who are doing quite a few quite a bit of business in this space. Again, going back to become a loan originator or work with a loan originator. Uh, make sure that either you or your loan originator is providing. Um, the correct disclosure forms to the buyers. Um, third one is I would work with a knowledgeable real estate attorney. Um, there are thousands and thousands of attorneys out there. There are, um, and there are thousands and thousands of attorneys out there who do not understand this area of the law. Um, and whether or not it's me or it's someone else, I, I would just advise you to find someone who knows this area and can help guide you through this area. Um, and if there are states in which you are doing a significant amount of business, I mean, if you're living and doing, you know, all of your business within one state, um, you, you should very seriously consider getting licensed um, in that state. And again, the final thing, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier. So for, the, for those individuals who are, who are doing this kind of on their own with their own money, um, that license is not going to be as huge of a deal as those individuals who are either working on with one-off investors, um, you know, on one, three, or five properties, or those individuals out there who are working through funds, um, essentially blind pools where you're where you're saying you're going to go out and, and buy 
buy notes, you can go out and go buy REL properties, and this is what this is the this is the practice you engage in. Um, there are some very serious ramifications um, for for you um, if you were doing that and you're not licensed and you're not disclosing um, properly. Um, and this kind of goes back. So, you know, one of the things that I recommend to to folks is in addition to being a lot of attorneys out there, there's a lot of securities attorneys out there. Um, but if you're in this space, um, I would have a, a securities attorney and a real estate attorney or, or get a securities attorney who also practices real estate in this area of the law to make sure that they're guiding you properly through this, this capital raising process or working with investors um, so that you don't get in trouble uh, down the road. Um, so Scott, that'll wrap it up for my PowerPoint. Again, here's my contact information um, for all those on the call. You know, feel free to reach out to me with any questions uh, after the webinar. Uh, email is the best way to get a hold of me, but if you prefer to, to call me on the phone, don't hesitate. Um, that's my office number listed there. Don't hesitate, hesitate to give my office a call. Um, and they'll put you through to me and I'll, I'll be happy to, uh, to answer questions for you. Cool, yeah, we definitely have a few questions here. So uh, we'll start at the top. So. Uh, so now says, can you elaborate on the rigors of being using a loan originator? Why are people trying so hard to get around being and using a loan originator? Time, cost, what, what, what's, why are people kind of anti doing that? Uh, you know, at least in my experience, I think a lot of people are anti doing that because it's an added step. Um, and, 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 and they don't want to take that added step. And I think, I think to a certain extent, given you know, a lot of a lot of people in this game are playing in the, I guess, the kind of the lower the lower end space. Uh, they they may be concerned about the borrowers having that additional funds to pay that cost at closing. Um, so I think those are the two biggest reasons, kind of the here um, from talking to folks. Right. What do you see as, as being like a good like cost for somebody using RMLO? You know, the one that I work with uh, most closely with a bunch of my clients, he charges a flat fee of 500 bucks. And what, that's whether or not it takes him one day to get the information, or, or we've had instances where we've had, we've had buyers who did not have email addresses. So everything had to go, you know, back and forth via the mail, and it took him a couple weeks to get the information. Personally, I don't, I don't think, um, I don't think, I don't think 500 bucks is, is, is too much of a cost uh, to avoid uh, the potential for some of the penalties that could result. Um, again, you know, those penalties, I mean, instances where, you, where you're doing onesies, twosies, you know, a year not gonna be huge, but if you're, if you're out there doing five or 10 of these a month and you're not losing, using a loan originator, um, you've, you've got some exposure as well as your investors have some exposure if you're using investors. All right, that was $500, just a flat fee or $500 per hour? It's kind of muffled a little bit, Jason. It's a $500 flat fee. Just a five hundred dollar flat fee. I think Brady asked that question there down there below and it popped up. So yeah, that's 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 quite affordable. Now you know what states that's in. He actually will originate all of the. He will actually originate the entire country. Oh, okay. Hang on a second. Because <laughs> somebody's like, "How would you find one?" And I've had people, "Oh, it's thirty five hundred or five thousand. We got one guy here in Texas who likes to call it a a Wally wrap that charges thirty five hundred dollars a side. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. But five hundred dollars for anywhere in the country—that's freaking phenomenal. He's your brother. <laughs> he's not my brother. He's I'm actually, just he's actually uh, one of your mastermind students found him, and that's who—that's who I recommend to folks now. Oh, that's right. Okay, all right, all right. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right, good. Uh, Jack asked a question: Does the liability for originating a seller loan pass to someone who purchased that seller finance note? You know that's a good that's a good question, and I'm, and I'm not so sure I have a clear clear cut answer on that. Um, I don't I don't know to be honest. Um, I su I suspect. Um, you know I, I I mean this is me personally I could argue both sides of that equation. Right. Um, you know I think if you're I think if you're a buyer of of these type of these type of notes. Um, you'd, you'd be best off um, in terms of do, when you're doing your due diligence to ask those questions and to ask for that loan originator file, to, you know, to ask for those signed documents. Right. It's part of your due diligence file. Um, and then at the end of the day, it's, it's whether or not you're going to make the business. If they don't have that, it's whether or not you're going to make the business call that, 
you know, to take on any potential liability that may, may come to you as a result of that. Mm -hmm. um, we'll ask question, would you recommend doing lease options and REOs if you do more than four or five seller financing in a state? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, there is, some, there is I do, and I'd actually recommend that to clients. Um, and I actually know a couple of the a couple of the bigger players in this space in the country have switched their model over to to lease options. Um, there, however, there is some some debate um, out there of whether or not because in, in most instances when you do a lease option, a portion of your lease payment is going to buy down um, that purchase price. Um, and so there is some debate out there, although there's nothing nothing definitive and there's no case law out there on it. There is some debate on whether or not that in and of itself could fall underneath owner finance. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, that, that, that to me seems like a little bit of a stretch because, you know, you're still able to terminate, you know, upon default uh, in most instances. Um, but I think you've got a much better case. You know, if you don't want to use a loan originator and you don't want to get licensed in the state, you're, 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 that's probably the, the less, uh, the path of less resistance, um, uh, kind of the, the Kind of the way that I would suggest you go is to just to go ahead and do the, do the lease option. Um, you know, do it with the idea that you're giving them the ability to, over the course of two or three years, to clean up their credit and to go out and get financed through the traditional sources. Right. Is there a uh, what specific website you recommend for people to go to to check out the various state laws? Yeah, I mean, re really, the, the best place to start is nmls.org, I believe is what it is. Um, you know, you can click on state licensing and then you can click on your specific state and it'll bring up um, the licensing requirements. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff there, um, you know, doesn't, it doesn't typically have the definitions there, um, but it'll, gi it'll give you kind of an idea of the license that, that may be required. Um, ultimately, to dig in, you've got to go to, you've got to go to the, state, uh, the state laws just see how they're defining everything. Um, I, you know, I do, um, I think, I, I, I can't remember the last time it was updated, but I did have a spreadsheet um, that had all that information on there, had all 50 states and the license that, that may be required in that state. Um, you know, Scott, you and I can talk after that. And maybe if it's, if it's pretty up to date, I'm happy to kind of send it over to you and let you distribute it out to folks. Cool. Would you mind sending the slides as well? I had a couple of people ask for, if they could get a copy of your slides there too. Yeah, yeah you bet. I'm more than happy to do that. Cool, cool. Um, let's see. Okay. What was the name of the website? Again, like you were kind of muffled there. What was the name of the website? The RMLO? It's nmls.org. I don't know if it's, if it's, if it's .org or nmlsconsumer.org, but if you type in NMLS uh, into uh, your search engine, um, it should be one of the top ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's going to be across the top, there'll be a bar which says state licensing. You'll click on that bar of state licensing it'll bring up a state map and then you just go and click on the state um, that you're interested in finding out about. And that'll, that'll list the licenses there uh, for you. Right. Um, a couple questions here. Uh, can one use a servicer for all functions of a mortgage originator? So no need to become one. Uh, use a servicer for all, all, all services for the loan originator. Well, just using a, a, a licensed loan servicer, and that, I can answer the question. That all depends, Frank, who was asking the question, if your licensed loan servicer is a licensed originator in that state. Uh, not every servicer is, so that's why you have to take, take, double check that with your specific servicer. You can check that by just going to the National Mortgage Lending Service and also checking on that list um, and seeing if they're a licensed originator or just licensed to be a servicer. Okay? Um, let's see here. Awesome, Frank. This is good. Nice. Um, we already got that figured out, Todd. I just repeated that. Um, let's see. We already covered that. We already covered that. Okay. If I purchase a non-performing real estate note and restructure the existing note, how does your discussion today apply to me? So there's a couple things with that, Bob, where you're modifying or just doing a forbearance agreement. Um, those kind of two different things. Jason, you want to discuss that? Yeah, and I would say that, um, I mean, if you're doing a forbearance agreement, obviously, I, I, in my opinion, this, this stuff is not going to apply to forbearance agreement. Right. Um, the modification, um, you know, that probably, at least in my opinion, probably that it depends on the extent to which you're modifying. You know, if, you're, if you're forgiving, if you're forgiving principal or you're modifying interest down, 
I would say that 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 most of this is most, if not all, of this discussion is not likely going to apply. If you're going to completely rewrite the note, um, then I would say that you're probably looking at that these laws uh, are going to apply to a situation like that. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, let's see here. We already discussed that Eric's question on how to find an MLL. A second here, going through. What states do you work in, Jason? Uh, well, I actually uh, I'm, I'm licensed in in Washington, Idaho, uh, and Montana, and soon to be Oregon. Um, but but as but as I mentioned, I've got clients all over the country, um, and and I tend to I tend to do, you know, obviously litigation all over the country, but there's a lot of things that I can do um, because my entire practice is based on, on based on contracts. Um, so, so I do a lot of work across the country. Right. And you want them to contact you to get that RMLOs information instead of you giving it out publicly, they got to contact you? Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. Because we give it out here, but then they're not going to contact you for their services. You've been nice to take time out there to be uh, be with us here. Okay. Uh, William asks, can you go ahead and, I think you may have joined late. Can you put each MLO or no, I'm sorry, not MLO. Can you put each note into an individual grantor's land trust to get around this? Yeah. And so, um, you know, we did touch on that a little bit earlier. Um, and I, and I think, you know, that's one of the, one of the options that I have clients who are using around the country. Um, and, and, and there's, I think there's two different kind of scenarios one scenario is where you've got a different beneficial owner of each one of those land trusts or the scenario where you've essentially got the same beneficial owner of those grantor land trusts. So I think if you've got an investor who is the, who's the, who's the beneficial owner of that land trust and a different one for each land trust, I think that's a, that's a possible uh, kind of way around um, you know, these rules and regulations. If you're, if you're trying to say that, you know, I'm going to use my company ABC LLC as the, as the beneficial owner of each and every one of those land trusts, you know, I think well, technically you may, you may, you may be clear of the law. I think you're clearly violating the spirit of the law. Um, and there, there may be some potential liability there um, just as if you were using subsidiary LLCs rather than, rather than land, or land trust with the same beneficial owner. That makes sense. Have you seen any, uh, um, Crackdown with Dodd Frank, you know, like how how aggressive is the government with some of the Dodd Frank violations? You know, uh, you know, and I'm assuming a lot of your folks that you know. I think it was it was a year or two ago. There was the big article about Harbor in the in the New York Times. Um, you know, and and actually, uh, Harbor Harbor's the one I was talking about when they when they've now become licensed in the state they're doing business in. Um, at least according to, according to my knowledge, I don't think. Um, I, I think given the current stance of the current administration, um, I, I don't think you're likely to see significant crackdown, um, you know, while Republicans still control, um, you know, and, and, then, and then obviously it depends on, you know, what happens to Dodd Frank. Um, but again, keep in mind that the, that the violations of the state lending laws is, is determined by each individual state as opposed to, you know, the, the current administration um, and attorney general is not enforcing that. It's, it's each state um, enforcing that. Right. I, I totally agree with you. And then uh, I was actually on the phone with Harbor today. They actually, it, it's been dragging out because we buy contract for deeds from them on a kind of regular basis. And they've been kind of slowing things down, going back and double checking themselves on some of these, these states that have been licensed in. <laughs> Nothing like bad publicity to make you want to do things right, right? <laughs> Um, question here. So Danny has a question. So Jason, how can we work with you? Uh, for example, if I've got an REO in Florida, and we'll offer, uh, offer owner financing, how do you come into the picture? Sure. And so, I, so what I do for, for my clients is um, essentially, you know, I require all my clients who, who want to work with me to have to either be licensed as a loan originator or to, to have that loan originator in the middle. Um, and so what happens with the people that I work with is once they've got a, a purchase and sale agreement or, you know, an agreement in place, um, they turn the file over to the loan originator. The loan originator does what he needs to do, gets his documents and paperwork in order. He sends out an email. That email comes to me and to my client that says, hey, I've, I've done stuff. Here are my documents. That's a cue to me. Then I prepare the, I prepare the contract for deed package, um, which, you know, includes contract for deed, which includes a promissory note. Uh, which includes a couple of additional disclosure documents that that I that I that I make a part of the package, and then we actually help close the transaction. Um, so you know we'll we'll collect the 
the earnest money or the down payment if that hasn't been collected. Um, we'll collect our fee, we'll collect the loan originator fee, um, and then we'll, we'll collect um, original signatures for all the documents, compile those, um, we'll email original signatures to the buyer, and then we'll send all the originators to, all the originals uh, to my client who, who is the seller. Um, cool. That transaction is closed and, and, and they're kind of off and running. Okay. Um, Jack asked the question here, can you be the manager and one of the beneficial owners in different land trusts with a unique property in each trust? Uh, say that again, Scott. Yeah. Can you be the manager and one of the beneficial owners in different land trusts with a unique property in each trust? Yeah. So, you know, one of my, one of my clients actually is they've got the, they've essentially got the same trustee um, of all their land trusts, but they have different beneficial owners. So I would say that, you know, that is going to, you know, partly depend on, um, you know, how many you're doing. And are, are you owning a 50% interest in a hundred of these? Um, are you owning a 50% interest in, in three of these? Um, you know, I think you're, you're, again, you're playing in the somewhat of a gray area there. If you're saying you're going to be the 50% beneficial owner of a hundred of these land trusts, um, you know, I, I realize that you're likely to have, uh, you know, a different investor um, you know, per deal or a different investor per, you know, four or five deals. Um, and I would say to you there that, you know, keep in mind when you're, when you're, um, when you're naming, a, naming an investor, um, whether it be on title um, or, or in a land trust like that, you know, that lender uh, or that investor um, is also a seller and is also a seller financer. So I, I would say you, you'd be wise to have a conversation with that investor to make sure that that investor understood um, the potential ramifications um, that, that could result um, because otherwise that investor is going to come back on you um, and that you didn't disclose this um, and you know, you'd find yourself potentially in, in court against your investor. Right. Um, does your RML work in New York State? It's a difficult state to work in for mortgages. You know, I haven't done any in New York with him, but I'm but I'm more than happy to. Um, if, if whoever asked that question wants to email me um, that question, I'm more than happy to to ask him um, and and then then respond uh, to whoever asked that question. Cool. Now, with the owner financing, what are kind of the, the normal terms that you're seeing across the board? I know it can vary a little bit, but what do you guys roughly see? And let's just do a split it up in between contract for deeds being one aspect and then traditional mortgages being a second round. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the similar terms kind of across the board. And I want to say, you know, I'm seeing 20 to 30 year terms um, and I'm seeing interest rates between eight and 12. Um, you know, with payments due on the first, I've got some clients who are giving five day grace period, other clients who are giving 15 day grace periods. Um, you know, obviously all, all of my clients are, are, you know, are doing, uh, collecting taxes and insurance. So they're doing, you know, they're collecting everything as part of the payment. Um, down payment wise, I, I'm typically seeing, uh, almost exclusively it's either 500 or a thousand bucks or, or 999 is typically what I'm seeing for kind of earnest money down. Um, on all the deals that I've done recently. The more the better, but that they're at least getting something down, some skin in the game instead of nothing, right? Right, exactly. Cool. And then are you seeing a lot of the arms after the five-year arms? Kind of, I, actually have, I actually have not seen any of those recently, no. I saw that was I thought it was an interesting point, being an ex-mortgage broker uh, on, on the points there that you made earlier on about the high exactly five years and they can only adjust so much and, and, and things like that, which is great. But I think a lot of people when they're looking at financing, I think that's a, a, a scary word for them for the most part coming from whatever happened in the last eight, nine years. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. No, I'd agree with you there. Cool. Cool. One other question of Jason before you let him go on is Monday evening, everybody. Uh, you also do PPMs for people. They're putting together some um, private placements for larger bulk purchases. Correct, Jason? I do. Yes, I, I do. Uh, that's, that's, that's greater than 50% of my, of my kind of my workload. This is, is, is doing private placement memorandums for specifically for, for real estate investors. Cool. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay. Some questions here. Uh, oh, let's see if we got any posts on Facebook live cause we're live streaming it there as well. Uh, yeah, contact Jason. So I want to make sure you guys contact information there for you. Any other pointers 
you know, you, uh, you've dealt with, you deal with a lot of investors. What's the, the base thing that really kind of drives you bonkers that some people don't do and what to avoid? <laughs> um, you know, the, the biggest one, and I've seen, I've seen investors get in big trouble with this is disclosure. Um, disclosure, disclosure is the biggest one. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been on, on the unfortunate end of, of, of helping clients um, in front of the SEC as well as, as state securities agencies. Um, that's not a fun end to be on. Um, and, and, and almost exclusively revolve, resolve, revolves around, um, you know, failure to disclose um, or, or improperly disclosing things. So, I mean, my advice is, is to disclose, 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 and doing it uh, a conversation or a phone call. Um, I always advise people to follow up with an email that says, hey, you know, based on our conversation today, we discussed this and this and this. You know, please let me know if, I, if my recollection is, is not serving me correct and kind of leave it at that and, and store those emails away and that, that investor's file or that, that person's file that you have it for, for future reference. Always good to document those things, the questionnaires and having people sign off on disclosures and let them know exactly what they're getting into, correct? Correct, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, have you done any, uh, Jim asked the question, have you done any Reg A applications yet or plan to? Uh, you know, yes, I've actually got... Um, Flip Street Capital, um, that entity that I'm that I'm a principal in, um, we're going to be doing a, a reggae offering, um, probably probably a fifty million dollar reggae offering. Um, I've got I've actually got a, a note investor client who is considering doing one, um, and then um, and I talk to people about it all the time, um, but I think people are still a little hesitant to kind of jump jump into that end yet just yet. Um, but I think. Um, you know, given the number that are that are coming out and the number of kind of bigger players that are using it and using it effectively, um, you know, I think that's going to be a, a great place for, especially for note investors and REO investors, um, because when you can accept money from everybody and not just, you know, accredited investors, um, you know, the pool of, of money that you're opening yourself up to is just incredible. Exactly. Exactly. I totally agree with that. What other questions you guys have for Chase before we let him go on this Monday evening? Oh, there you go. One more pop-up. No, uh, Casey, I'm not going to ask Jason to send you a list of his private investors. <laughs> hey, you don't get what you don't ask for, right, Jason? You got to at least ask that. Exactly. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> uh, awesome. Good stuff there. Everybody says thanks, thanks, thanks. Well, Jason, thank you so much for taking time tonight to join us here, share your insight of that. Uh, I'm going I'm to go ahead and drop you an email with those that actually attended here. Uh, as well, so that you've got their contact information and follow up with them as you need to, if you'd like to. Does that sound cool? That's cool. Great. And then let's, let's see here. That's right. <laughs> great call. Thanks. Good stuff. Casey says thanks. That's right. That's good stuff. So uh, I'll also send you the recording for this as well, Jason, here. Um, guys, thanks so much for taking us. Great questions. Great insight. Uh, Jason, question I have for you, Jason, before we let you go. Have you heard about the, the Seller Finance Coalition that's taking place? Are they they're working kind of to loosen up the uh, the reins to go from one to, to a dozen, sort of one to as many as possible? you heard about what's going on in, in Wall Street with that? Or not Wall Street, but in D.C.? I have not, no. Check it out. Uh, Seller Finance Coalition is kind of uh, actually meeting with uh, Congress tomorrow, some of the representatives out there, to knock some stuff out. So uh, I know that... Uh, yeah, I know that uh, H Speed's a part of that, Bob Repass, and then uh, Jeff Watson's also up and I was in training from Ohio and some stuff like that. So, all right. So, well, thanks, Jason. I appreciate it so much. I'll be in touch with you as well. I'm sure a lot of these people will be working with you and knocking some things out. Guys and gals, that's that's what we've got for this Monday evening. We're right at uh, an hour there for you guys. I think so. Let me pull up to make sure we're right at that. Yeah. Looks like we're good. Oh, yeah, perfectly. So, very valuable information. If, if seller financing is a strategy you're wanting to add to your REO space, hey, this is this is how you get it done. And trust me, five hundred dollars to get all the documents and the things structured, phenomenal uh, value. And if somebody can do it in most of the countries, why not work in one with one person versus trying to go out and cherry pick and find one guy here or one gal there? Save your time. Work with the experts. Let them do their stuff, and you go out and do the things you do best. But finding assets and raising capital make things happen for you guys. So, uh, Jason, once again, thank you so much for joining us Monday night, everybody. 
Uh, everybody out there, the recording will be up uh, later tonight, first thing tomorrow morning. Thank you for the great questions, and uh, we'll see you all next Monday night or the next note. Otherwise, have a great evening, and we'll see you all later, everybody. Bye. Thanks, Jason. You bet. Thanks, Jack. Right, and...